everybody. You are back watching and or listening to the Hot Rod Pod, where it all began by Motor Trend. I am Brian Loans, joined, as always, by the editor of Hot Rod Magazine, John McGann. John, we're going to talk to a guy you've known for many years in a, in a very close fashion, the proprietor of Nelson Racing Engines, Tom Nelson. He's a hilarious dude. Uh, we got the, the bleep button got to work out here. <laughs> and, and, and There was smoke coming off that <laughs> thing by the end of this episode. And, and that was tamed by Tom standards, too, which is funny if you watch any of his YouTube stuff. Uh, <laughs> he gets spicy. Um, but that's part of his character. We knew he'd be a great guest, um, just you know, obviously because of his big personality. But also, he's an extremely accomplished engine builder. And um, we get into all that stuff about how he got started. Yes. Uh, self-taught machinist, engine builder, going into business on his own. And what I'm impressed with is he's always the the his vision evolves, but it's always kind of focused around a package yes. that people can buy and drop into their car, and it's a drivable package uh, of you know that makes a lot of power, um, but it's also art. It is. It's art, and he talks about himself as an artisan and as his business as artist. We'll talk about the innovations he created. We'll talk about some of the the highest highs that he's lived through and really some of the lowest lows. And some of these stories, I can guarantee you, you don't know because I don't think he's ever told them in public before, mm -hmm. whether it's plummeting off a cliff in Iceland or whether it's <laughs> putting a 632 with twin turbos in an airboat or whether it's being an innovator and really a leader in terms of social media in the aftermarket. Mm -hmm. He spills it all. It was a great, uh, great discussion. Um, I was really looking forward to this episode, and Tom didn't disappoint. And if you have ever taken one of those ear tests where they put the little beepy noises in your ear, you'll feel like you're in one of those during some of the parts of this episode because <laughs> the language, well, it gets a little spicy, but don't worry. It's fun for all family members and all ages. We got you handled. It is a great episode. And here it is, the gospel according to Tom Nelson. Tom Nelson, Nelson Racing Engines fame, seven-time Hot Rod Magazine cover guy. That's we got awesome. Lots to, we got a lot to talk about. Yeah. Well, that was my favorite cover. I think it was, uh, you know, my taking over the magazine and we arranged that 40,000 horsepower uh, photo shoot with you at your place and just such a cool picture Wes Allison took. Oh, yeah. I was sick. I, I mean, I, for me, I still, you know, print. Everybody's saying I don't print, you know, mm -hmm. but for me to get to cover a hot rod, it's like being the playmate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> only, only certain people get the cover a couple times. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. it's actually, I think... It might be 10, actually, wow. maybe. I don't know. But Hot Rod's been good to me. <laughs> it has been good to you, and that's why we want to have you on the show, not only to talk about your history with the magazine, obviously, but to talk about kind of your entire history in the industry. And for those of you that don't know, Tom Nelson's been officially in the racing engine business since 1995, but he's been into cars and hot rods his entire life. And so, you know, his his involvement in so many things is, is kind of what we want to touch on here. And like we've touched on with everybody else, I think there mm -hmm. are fascinating elements of the business that you're in that people – really at home don't necessarily know how this stuff works, right? Yeah. And so I guess for us, you know, the, the back title of this show is where it all began. So I if my if my memory is correct, it begins with a Pantera and some turbochargers, but but for you as a kid, where did the hook get set? Uh well my dad, um my dad was always like SCCA racing. He had like um he had a, a well first he had a Corvair where he would SCCA race the Corvair. Then he got a Boss Mustang. With nice. A, he put it, you know, in a 410 with the top loader. I mean, my brother be in the back seat going like 55 on the freeway because the thing was winding <laughs> out. And buses are passing us. Uh, and we'd always be going faster than that. Everything's passing us. He's like, relax, man. You know. And then, um, you know, then he got a Pantera and he twin turbocharged the Pantera in the garage. And that, you know, I don't know. I, I think he kind of set the bug in me. You know, and uh, which for the time, I mean, you, you, obviously, we're talking about a talented guy here, right? Because to pull that off, mm -hmm. and what I'm guessing is the 80s, it's a lot different than today, and we're going to get into all that. But, but the, the scope of that project at home in the 80s seems pretty big. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, you're talking about throwing tools and cussing, that's where I learned it, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he took a set of old, like old Ray J's and then uh, made like these kind of cool logs. Uh, I think Hal Pantera had the like initial kit. And then it it drew through a set of Delarotos, you know. Oh wow! So like low speed uh, drivability was not exactly good. Yeah. But which made it cool because he was always revving the shit out of it just to make it work, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I I actually have a video of when I was a kid or my brother was in the driver. I don't know which one of us was in the uh, 
in the passenger seat, but we have a video of like this road, which is now all populated, but he'd take us and there was nobody there. And we'd just rip it and it'd decamber the front wheels like third, fourth. You could hear the turbos like, you know, one was behind your ear, one was behind. And that kind of ruined me, you know. I was like, man, this thing hauls ass. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, and ultimately we kind of started our company doing offshore marine. So we did like 1471, you know, blown big blocks. And it's kind of eye opening when you, are running on a gas blown big block, you think this thing sounds like it's making 5,000 horse, you know, mm-hmm. and it makes like 1,200 horse, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> but to do that in an offshore marine application, which is basically at full throttle all the time right. and then bouncing through the water. Yeah. I'll, one, I'll tell you one thing is like a uh, crankshaft manufacturer and how you cut that radius in an offshore marine application. If you even have, like, the stone has just a little mess up in the radius, mm-hmm. you just snap the rod pin right off. Wow. Because that it comes out of the water, bam, comes back in the water, mm-hmm. comes back out of the water, and it's just, you know, it, the game, it definitely teaches you how to build a motor right. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would. Because <laughs> you're going to break it really quick. You and know? you're talking about the fillet between the, the crank. Uh, the, exactly, yeah. 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 The, the yeah. throw and the... Yeah, that little radius, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which you wouldn't think much of. I remember regrinding some pretty nice cranks, Mm -hmm. and the stone wasn't dressed right, and it just had just a little, like, you could feel a little bit in the radius. Mm -hmm. Both motors snapped in half. Wow. You know? Wow. So what, what's the mid step? What's the wh- where, how do we get from the Pantera to building offshore engines? Because that to me is a fascinating point too. So mm-hmm. what was a either your your natural innate training or what was like what went on between you being enraptured by your dad's twin turbo Pantera to then being able to be hired by offshore boat racing teams to build these motors? I think well first it was a go kart right. So I wanted a go kart and um, my dad was always like you know leaning into me to, you know, you got to earn it, you know, you got to, so we were the kids on Saturday, like picking weeds for half the day, and (laughs) you know, but, um, so I had saved up a couple summers and I had the money to go get this go-kart. So we went out and, and found this, like, uh, it was like a, a Penske Indy car. It was like a Safeway giveaway type Mm go-kart. So it looked like a little Indy car. It was all yellow. It had like the Penske graphics on it, and it had a three and a half horse Technosum engine in it. Mm-hmm. I, to this day, I don't think I've ever had more fun in something. Even see these <laughs> badass things we built, still not as cool as that damn go kart uh-huh. I got, you know. Uh-huh. And you know, um, my one friend Danny Gary uh, ended up getting the same one in white, and it was just a little faster, you know. <laughs> and just That's a problem. Yeah, he just always, you know. I, I think at the time, I, I, I probably make this sound more than it is, but there was a girl um, uh, on our cul-de-sac. I mean, her, I think her name was Noelle. And, like, we'd all we'd both be going around the corner, and he'd just have to just shh right past me. I'm just like, you know. <laughs> you can't have that. And there was a guy working for my dad at the time. His name is Garl. And um, I was telling him, I'm like, man, how do you make this thing faster? And he's like, have you bypassed the governor in this thing? And I'm like, what's the governor? Mm-hmm. You know? He was like, oh, let's do this. So he showed me how to bypass the governor. And, man, it picked up like 15 miles an hour, you know. I was like, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's all me and Danny going around the corner again, you know. I was like, uh, yeah. Check like, something's later. wrong with my car. I'm like, I think something <laughs> is, you know. So, at any rate, that turned into, um, it was kind of like people would see me driving around this like indie car around, and it was kind of like a good promo thing. So, I opened up an auto detailing business. So, okay. I think I was like 12 or 13, and, uh, you know, I rigged up the back off the side of where, where the motor was, and I had vacuums and all this stuff, and then... Wow. Wait, so you would drive this thing around with a bunch of car care supplies oh, attached yeah, to it? Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, 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 yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. I actually, I went, I made flyers. Me and my buddy made flyers. It was called DNT Auto Detailing, and, uh, and we put flyers in everybody's mailbox, everybody that I could get to. Yeah. And then... Um, we, I forgot who, 
I think it was uh, like a post office agent came to the yes, door. Yes, you can't do that. It's you cannot... federal offense. Yes. Yes. It's a federal offense. You can't man. put stuff in people's mailboxes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, luckily they didn't. It was like per mailbox is a oh, fine wow. or something like that. Oh, you know. <laughs> so that advertising thing, but, but it got me a bunch of clients, you know. <laughs> And so then I would just buzz the old Indy car up to their house, and pretty soon I was like waxing turbo Porsches and doing all this stuff. I was like, I remember my shoulder; I got like a almost shoulder injury from so much freaking polishing mm-hmm. at my age, you know. So that kind of started the entrepreneurship of mm-hmm. doing stuff, and then that kind of led into uh, street racing. So street racing was really big time when I was, you know, in high school and yeah. stuff. I obviously probably way more big time now but you know back then we thought big bet was a thousand bucks or something we're like oh it's big money you know yeah but um anyway we started street racing and you know was doing quite well with it you know and i was like kind of doing all sorts of crazy stuff hidden nitrous systems and like multiple hidden nitrous systems so when they'd find one (laughs) they'd take the bottle out of the car he had two more bottles in the car (laughs) so it was really Uh pretty cool Uh and um so we started street racing, and then um, and then that got um, nasty. Like the gangs got involved, yeah. and I saw a guy like run across the street, and they ran him over. And then uh, there was uh, like an argument over one race guy got shot. Way too dangerous. Yeah, yeah, it's got out of control. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this isn't for me anymore. You know, this this the scene used to be great because you just get in there and I'm allowed to cuss. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, so <laughs> we've, yeah. We've already gone down that yeah, road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sailor, so. But um, yeah, so you just go talk, and that was half the fun was the talking. You know, I actually trained my little brother to go scan the cards and check for skill- <laughs> silicone, and I'd, I'd have him call out what the car had and everything. It was just that was half. That was part of the, you know part of the deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at that point, I was like, you know what, this is getting a little sketchy. Um, but I really loved doing it, and I had. Um, I had a construction company because my mom had a property management uh, company. So I would take on all sorts of weird things like, you know, whatever, building fences for 50 houses or wow. painting things or whatever. So there was like actually like there was real money in that job. Like yeah, right. <laughs> our job right, right, right now is not, not the same. like I could buy a two by four <laughs> for two dollars and sell it for like four or five. <laughs> right now I could buy a block for like two thousand and sell it for twenty one hundred. <laughs> you know? And then they're like, it's the wrong main. You own that block, you know? <laughs> so uh but anyway, I didn't um I didn't really love it. You mm-hmm. know, I just uh I remember going to work like there's like a bridge on the freeway. When I crossed that bridge, I almost felt like, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Here we go again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to pick glue off the floor or something, you know, for a day. So I started, my grandmother gave me her garage and I rigged it up and we put 220 and three phase and all that stuff in the garage. And I had bought a vertical mill, I bought a boring bar. And I was buying, you know, equipment to start building my buddy's engines. And I, I suspected that's what I wanted to do for a living. And then my good buddy, uh, Cole Balster, um, his dad, uh, he he did, like, the body and white programs. So oh, he, wow, okay. Yeah, so he would give out, like, you know, a car to a pro stock team or something. So he had, like, a lot of relationships with different people. And there was a, a guy, there was these guys, the Scribner brothers. Scribner I don't know. brothers, Harry yeah. Scribner. There you go. He won one pro stock race in his whole career. <laughs> okay. The three brothers, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Those really? are the, the three brothers. No joke. No yeah, joke. That's yeah. awesome. So the Scribner brothers, I think their cousin was Bill Hyatt. I don't know if okay. you know who Bill. And Bill Hyatt had passed away. And um, uh, Cole's Larry, Larry Balster, uh, the Scribners are like, you know, do you know of anybody who um, was interested in a machine shop? He's like, matter of fact, you know, my my one of my best friend's son is actually building one. And they're like, well, uh, you know, Bill passed away and we're looking to sell this thing, you know. Wow. And uh, I walked in, it was in Reseda, you know, and uh, I don't know if you know Hyatt, but Hyatt was like, uh, you know, really good at what he did. I, I've never, I ne- obviously never met him or anything, but his name, I mean, I knew his name. His name would show up in different places, so yeah. Yeah. So, um any rate, I walked into this place and it was like, you know, the lights of heaven. (laughs) Had like a, I still use this today at SF 600 flow bench, which is my flow bench today. Mm -hmm. 
had a, a like a manual go power, like where you're like, eh, you know, you're trying to, you know, had a dyno in there yeah. and had a lot of equipment that I still uh, use today. Um, but the the trick was that somebody had already put a deposit on it, but it had been a year. Uh, hmm. And they're like, look, you know, whoever comes to the finish line first. And um, and so I bid this fence contract in like the middle of summer was I, in Simi Valley of all places. It was like 115 degree summer, you know, mm -hmm. and I did like 100 fences in um, I don't know what it was. It was like, let's say, let's call it a month. Jeez. And uh, and I ended up coming in with a cashier's check like as we finished the deal, the other guy came in with a check. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So it was like, you know, and that other guy is such a good guy. Like, it was kind of weird, to, mm -hmm. to, but we're still friends. Um, he mm -hmm. used to run a shop, like a production engine shop. And what's even weirder about that is the Align Hone that is in my shop, he was the guy who originally started the shop before Hyatt did. Mm -hmm. And that, that Line Hone, he, like, took a loan to pay for it. I still have, oh, wow. not Line Hone, Line Bore. It was a Torbenarp Line Bore. Yeah, yeah. And, uh. So I don't know, maybe it was for me to do, or I don't know, but it was just one of those things where we just, it worked out. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, that was a start of professional Nelson racing. That was in 1995 out of a professional shop. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I swear to God, I mean, I walked in there and like every machine I didn't know how to use, you know, <laughs> but I was like, what does well, this button do? <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Talk about jacking things up. So I, I actually, uh, traded a guy, um, so he knew how to use some of the machines. So he's like, if I can use these machines, I'll show you how to do it. And that was a mistake because he didn't know what the hell he was doing. <laughs> so he showed me all the wrong ways on how to right. do it. In retrospect, that probably may not be the guy you want to learn from. Right. The guy who's willing to right. trade it for free may not be the guy. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, as you may know, or actually both of you guys may know is, I don't know if you know a guy named Gene Ole from um, Evans Speed Equipment. Is that name ring a mm -hmm. bell? No. Like old school Evans Speed school, Equipment? Yeah. So Evans Speed Equipment, like one of the early manufacturers, like uh, Flathead, you know, Flathead Ford stuff. Yeah, so I'm, I'm familiar with the name Evans. I do not know the uh, the Ole guy. Okay, so Gene Ole, he was the guy in my dad's mags, you know? Yes. And this, so I was selling a wet grinder because this thing stunk like hell. And I already had a surfacer. So a wet grinder is like it's in you surface heads, but with a stone rather mm -hmm. than with a with a carbide. Mm -hmm. It was actually I was bummed after I sold it because with a stone, you the heads that have the seats sticking out, mm -hmm. you can grind them without dragging steel across the aluminum. Oh, yeah. But at any rate, he had wanted that. He came by the shop and like in a just extremely gentleman fashion saw that I didn't know what the hell I was doing, you know. So I don't know. Maybe he liked the idea that, you know, I was a younger guy kind of. So every weekend we kind of bartered for different things and he just showed me how to do the stuff properly, like how to true in a line hone, how to true in the rod hone, how to. And, you know, before you knew it, I mean, he brought me from here to here mm -hmm. in six months wow. or a yeah. year that just. It was pretty much invaluable, yeah. you know. But I guess everybody needs somebody as a mentor in in that, you know. And and he he really helped me out in in my machining career, you know. So that's kind of how Nelson Racing started. Is we you know just that's how it kind of started, you know. What were the first projects you had once you once you were up and running in that new shop? What was the first type of stuff that started coming through? I was whoring out, man. Yeah, anything, <laughs> just anything, dude. I was like, I mean, I was taking like a line born babbitt bearing flatheads the worst jobs of all time and, uh, i mean dog you know 350s where you're just like it didn't i whatever you know yeah. the first 10 yeah. years um i had a decent savings from the construction company and i lost money every year for 10 years mm. you know i mean it was it was almost a joke like i You'd come home and the and the power was off and you're like, it's gonna be peaceful tonight, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not gonna have to worry about anything tonight. No one's gonna be bugging us. Uh, I don't, I don't even TV. have to listen to the fridge because the fridge's gonna be dead, you know? <laughs> but don't open it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do remember um, you know, I do remember I had the this guy, uh, Ron Thal. He was uh, one of my 
wasn't my first employee, but he was one of my first serious employees. And the guy was absolutely amazing, you know. And um, he'd come in 8 o'clock exactly. He'd leave 5 o'clock exactly. He'd take lunch at the exact same time. Me, if you know me, I'm running a million miles an hour all the time. So I'd be, like, trying to speed him up. Could not speed him up. Could not slow him down. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, he did more than me, you know. Mm. And uh, anyway, I remember being in my office thinking, um, I don't know how I'm going to make his payroll. You know, and he's getting paid nothing. Yeah. And his wife is like doing him a salt to let him go after his dream of being an engine builder, yeah. you know. And it had gotten to the point where I'm like, I don't care if we close the doors. Like, I'm doubling my prices. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, if we don't get business, then cool. I'll go back to uh, doing, doing construction. construction. At double on prices, got double work, you know. Wow. And then double on prices again, get double work again. Wow. You know, so. That was like a big, and I still don't understand it because I still don't think we charge enough. But um, you know, know your value is like one of the biggest things, right? Mm -hmm. So, but back then you needed to you needed to kind of you needed to know how to do it before you right. had value. Yeah, that's true. You know? yeah, if you go double on the price with half the knowledge, you yeah. got a big problem. <laughs> yeah, but at, at a at a certain point, you realize like, hey, you know, I know what the hell I'm doing, and uh, and I'm putting way too much time for what you know. It, Every machine shop in the world would be like Bore and Hone or like Bore 75, Hone 50, like R&R Cam Burns 28. And, and you'd like, you'd look at all that and you'd be like, how the hell do I make a living mm -hmm. doing this? And mm -hmm. all the machine shop guys were all so dumb. Like we were just like, well, this is just standard pricing, yeah, you know? Right, right. And then, so I got out of the machine part of it and, uh, and decided to start doing packaging so you could come up with, you know, you know, a bill of materials, how much time you put into that and sell it as a crate, you know. Mm -hmm. And that those are failures too because for some reason I thought like I could get all this stuff for really cheap and do it really a lot faster than <laughs> – <laughs> uh, Do you know – you guys know Keith Eichert? Uh, Keith Eichert, yes. I've met Keith Eichert. Okay. Yes. So that is a funny story behind that because – my first PRI show, I'm in Indianapolis. I had brought five motors. We got these engines on a crate. We made like these big price tags that we hung like okay. on the motor. Yeah. And I had a supercharged 383 small block, yeah. like cra 8995. Mm -hmm. Like, what the? I can't even think. I, don't, I, I was so crazy that I was selling stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Right next to me was Keith Eichard. Like calling PRI saying, move me from this numb nuts. Cause he had a blown big block for 89,000 right next to oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> move me from this numb nuts. This guy's gonna sink us all. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like 28 years, I think, going on 28 years. It's nuts. You know, it's, it's, it's like time flies, you know. One of the things that I won't really want to get into um, about is the fact that you, uh, maybe ahead of anybody else in the business that you're in, recognize the value of – before it was even really social media, it right. was social media. You had NRE TV right. back before anybody was doing anything yeah. like this with video. So, one, what, what made you look around and go, okay, this is something we need to do? And then, two, it, it became wildly successful, and it still translates today. Your presence on YouTube and across social is, is huge for, for the business that you're in. Right. Yeah. So – Probably the biggest eye opener was there was a um, there was a blue Pontiac. Well, first, like my really good friend Mike Artman, um, this Mike Artman, great guy. Okay, Mike Artman, he is he is so talented that I try to tell him how talented he is all the time, and he's like, eh, he doesn't realize how badass he is, you know. And he had a guy uh, Ron Rado working for him. These two guys, I'm still really good friends with today. So he made me a website. It was like Flash, you know, back then. That was... I remember, right? yeah, yeah, right? So, animation. Yeah, and you'd click into the site, and it had a motor going like... Bah, bah. You know, I mean, this is <laughs> new stuff, right? This uh -huh. is like... At any rate, he did this site that was just like... It, nobody else had something like this. And then we had downloadable... We started filming videos that you could download, that you could have... And and so you wanted to see this engine package. I had a video of it, mm -hmm. and so that was a way to help me sell uh, the stuff that we did. But then, 
we had a video uh, released on what was called streetfire.net. No, oh, streetfire.net, for, for those of you that are not old like the three of us, <laughs> uh, before YouTube really became YouTube, streetfire.net was where car videos lived. That, yes. that was where you went to watch stuff. Yeah. So I remember walking into this place called Plumbing City, and I I didn't even release it. Somebody took it off my website and the download because they owned it at that time, and then they put it on Street Fire, and and this guy's like, "You're the guy from Street Fire, you know, you're the guy from Street Fire." Oh my God, look what's going on! I'm like, "What are you talking about?" Uh -huh. You know, and like that week, I, I must have been ten people came up to me and were talking to me about this video. I'm like, "What the hell?" I look, it had over a million views, like wow. immediately. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad, lucky, you know, that I, my dad. I don't know. He just – I wouldn't have my company the way it is without my dad because my dad, like, cut all these crappy videos that I would hand. I just – we had the worst cameras in the world, and we would just <laughs> – I would just talk around and whatever, and then he would cut it, and he, uh, he – he, for whatever reason, he liked porn music or something, and he would <laughs> mix everything with, like, his own version of porn music, and, like, that's what became NRE TV, you know? <laughs> And so he just started cutting each one of these videos, mm -hmm. and that like I used to pay like three thousand dollars a month with, you know, um, well I don't, it wasn't Prime Media at the time I don't even know whatever it was you know you'd buy an uh, ad in mm -hmm. CarCraft and then you'd buy oh I can afford a, a black and white little Ace right, ad right, that right. does rod. nothing you know, yeah. um, and uh, and then after I saw how much of that did versus what yeah you paid for an ad yeah. I was like, this is crazy. I'll put the extra time, I'll film these things, mm -hmm. and we'll we'll put them up. And that became a 24-hour salesman, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, like, that almost made us recession-proof because, mm -hmm. like, in the, in 08, when everything went to shit, yeah, like, uh, Australia went crazy. Like, like, I might as well have lived in Australia because we every engine was Australia. And no then Aust Australia went to shit. Yeah, and then it was Scandinavia. Like wow. it was like so wherever the dollar was <laughs> rotating yeah. around, decent, mm -hmm. and that was. Uh, but because of the reach of those videos, it, they would have never found you. Never, else. never. Yeah. yeah, our international audience, and it was, mm -hmm. it was, it was awesome. You know, so yeah, I remember the first time I met you was on Road Thrash. There was that uh, that cop that the issue of Hot Rod where Rob Kinnan put it together. We went out there with like this was in probably oh seven, yep. oh eight, yep. something like yep. that. It was like a Bone Stock sixty nine GTO. The F bomb was out there. Um, there was this wide range of cars, and and we drove them around all day, and everybody rotated through. And I remember I remember driving the F bomb and. The guys would get in this thing, and they had a trans brake, and they put it in reverse, and they couldn't get it to back up. Yeah, Marlon, <laughs> yeah, Marlon Davis, a couple of the guys were, <laughs> were not getting that. We got, I got to drive it after lunch, and we got in, and and we were putting our seatbelts on. He's like, he's like, well, it has a trans brake. I'm like, so I hit the button when I put it in reverse. He's like, yeah. He's like, you're the first guy. So I felt cool. The one time in my freaking life, That's I good. felt cool. That's good. <laughs> yeah, but you guys were. I remember you were filming there. I mean, you guys yeah. had your video cameras out there, and I thought to myself, geez, okay, this is. I had been watching the videos, but then it was such a foreign thing at the mm -hmm. time to not – if you're going to film something back then, it was like you needed the whole crew and you needed everything. And yeah. it was just such a shotgun deal you guys did. It was so successful. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we're going to start the YouTube channel again. I haven't been – it's been years and years. Um, we actually had uh, – like <laughs> we had – I think Kyle released this video of Maximus, and I had like no windshield in it, and we were doing like – you know, hundred mile an hour burnouts in it, <laughs> and the police didn't like that. <laughs> you got a phone call? Uh, they got a visit. Oof. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, um, any rate, I, and we we filmed the TV show that never went anywhere for like three years. Uh, so I kind of stopped all the YouTube. Mm. But um, and and it, you know, since you brought us there, I want to talk about that because you know that that turned into kind of. Physically a disaster for you, right? Yeah. You got hurt. Yeah. And so let's talk about the genesis of that show and then ultimately, uh, not to bring up a bad memory, but but what happened? Yeah, so we we filmed uh, this show. I mean, the, the name of it, I don't know what it is now. At the time, it, it was Driven. So um, one of my, like, the best customer I ever had, um, this guy Matt Swanson, like, was around the shop and he saw everything that was happening. And he was like, we got to turn this into something, you know, because you're doing stuff that's just, everybody thinks that we're just an engine builder, but like mm -hmm. 
we have we had like 25 full car builds going at once you know it was crazy when we're doing you know aluminum 3d printing full cnc all the cad design of we're making frames in house it was just crazy you know like so he's like we we got to do something with this and so um I met up with uh, this guy, Michael George, who is a producer, and then we decided to make an automotive show not based on, like, deadlines or We're going to lose the shop. Yeah, yeah. 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 So just on craftsmanship and then the story of, like, the owner and why he did it and everything. And it's probably the best uh, automotive show I've ever seen. Like, they came in, and Matt, if you know my, my this guy, Matt, he does not mess around. Like, if he's going to do something, he does it all the way you know so um they brought in a crew and everything was filmed on what these cameras called the red oh red U ultra prime yeah, yeah. and yeah. then they lit the shop we have like 70 foot lights so you turn the house light house lights off and everything's lit with a certain k you know i think oh, let's call it 5k but they had a special look that they mm -hmm. want they were going for and uh i mean like when we're at, give you an idea we went um we went to I put a twin turbo 632 in a airboat and then <laughs> we flew to Homosassa and got in this thing and me and my buddy Scott and this nutbag Nevin uh were driving this thing like he was dipping us neck full of this bacteria freezing cold freaking water and uh you know and and we got a helicopter with an arm, with not an arm. It's like it had like this crazy carbon fiber camera attached to the nose of the helicopter, following gimbal. us. My God! Uh -huh. Like I had a guy who um, won the Canadian lottery, and one of the uh, one of the <laughs> biggest things on Canadian the lottery. Yeah, yeah, right. So one of the biggest things on the internet is, is when I win the lottery, I'm going to Nelson. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know. <laughs> so he won the lottery i didn't know this and he started talking about these like pretty elaborate builds and then um he's like i'm gonna come down tomorrow i'm like you're gonna come down tomorrow you know okay whatever you know and like i get these you get weird calls like that all the time you're like mm -hmm. gonna click you know uh -huh. and he showed up the next day <laughs> wow and he saw this like twin turbo camaro that we had done and he was with his dad and he's, his dad's like man i love this car you know and he's like happy father's day so he bought a car and got a car build, and then got his dad a car build. Hmm. So for Father's Day, wow. the, Father's Day the next year, we built this twin turbo fifth gen. He bought a P1, by the way, and then he shipped the P1 down to Famoso. Freiburger and Dulcich were there. Okay, okay, oh, yeah, I think yeah they were there. Freiburger ended up driving with no <laughs> race suit. Really? Yeah, we didn't have a race. He just showed up. Like I'm not going to drive. I'm like, dude, I don't want the responsibility. Yeah. you know, and. uh Bob, I'm like, if you're gonna let me, I'll do it. And then he's like, <laughs> see, he has like a, a like the underpant, the the Nomex or whatever. The, the Nomex. So he drove in Nomex, you know, <laughs> typical, <laughs> typical driver. Well, you know, to wash my eyeballs out with bleach. <laughs> exactly. Like yeah. So we that we his dad took delivery of this car for the first time, got in it and raced his son's P1 at Famoso and smoked the P1. You know? wow. It was so awesome. cool. That's cool. Yeah, and Freiburger uh, took the F-bomb and smoked P1 too. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Freiburger are crazy, man. He got like all the way in the middle lane and didn't let out and like was like in the McLaren and got back in it and ran this horrible like nine second time, but <laughs> at, we didn't give a shit anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's cool. So at any rate, we did all these crazy things Even and we went to Iceland and... Uh, I had a customer who holds a record for driving on water. So he goes like 60 miles an hour on water and he did it for like a mile or something. So we're like, oh, cool. And it's a formula off-road race car. These things are, you don't want to be in them. <laughs> it's like a, and, and for those who've never seen one, like think of a, think kind of like a rock buggy, but with way more power, maybe way more articulation. I mean, how would you best explain to somebody who's never seen one? Sketchy, <laughs> you know, like I, I obviously, I don't want to like, um, you know, piss him anybody yeah, yeah. off. Yeah, no, but, but it's an off the wall thing. It's a nutty, nutty thing. It's like you know, it's got this thing had a fifteen hundred horse twin turbo Ford in it with paddles and like you know, and when we got there, like it wasn't even like I'm a, like I love this guy Bubby, but I was gonna kill him when we got there because <laughs> he showed me a picture of like at the 
what is that in in England? The Goodwood or oh Goodwood, Goodwood, good, good, yeah good Goodwood Festival. Festival. He showed me a picture of a Goodwood like flying like two weeks earlier. I'm like, oh, this thing's ready to go. You know, we're gonna fly out there and break some records on the water. You know, I get there and like half the car's not built. Wow. You know? Yeah. So we built and, and you know Iceland. It, there's no. It's night. It's like it, the sun never. <laughs> <laughs> like I, we worked like for four days. I don't even think I slept maybe four hours putting this thing together because we had talk about like a bill. We had flown everybody to Iceland and you know, we had all this crazy crew and everything. And at uh, any rate, we, you know, had like this 62 shot list that we we're going to do. And the first shot was we're going to go off 50 foot cliff, you know? And I'm like, why the hell do we have? Like, we're going to go off a 50-foot cliff. Like, I'm not even, like, a gnarly off-roader. We're going to go 50 feet off a cliff? You know, like. <laughs> right. And so I remember sitting there with uh, Bubby, and um, I'm like, so you do this all the time. And he's like, yeah, it's no problem, whatever. And then this girl, Elva, who was with him, was like, we've never done it. I'm like, hmm, woof. Mm -hmm. You never, what are you talking about, man? Like, mm -hmm. we're going off this thing. You haven't even done it before? It's no problem, you know, no mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. We ended up going off this cliff, and he knew what he was doing. Like, we he basically went vertical, and somehow he throttled it to kind of kick the nose at the bottom and wow. doesn't endo. And, like, after a little while, I was like, he knows what he's doing, you know? Yeah, you get comfortable. Yeah. All right, this guy's, this guy's got to yeah. yeah. But he, you get a camera on somebody, and, and mm -hmm. they, they don't act like they normally do. So we had a... I guess you could call it a, it's not a fire road, but we had this like a fire road and then there was like a cliff on the right hand side. And then we were following it with another Icelandic car that, by the way, you know, like I got, I got so enamored with all the film stuff, but they had this, um, cause it was raining. They had this thing. It's like, uh, it spins at 10,000 RPM in front of the camera to deflect the rain. Oh, no kidding. Get out of here. Wow. It's crazy. That Never is that cool. Existed. It's crazy. Yeah. I'll have yeah. to look that up. So yeah. it's like raining, but it's totally clear, you know? Wow. At any rate, he got in full boost in first. There's a cliff right here. And, like, regained composure. I was like, oh, like that was almost death. Mm -hmm. Puts it in second, clicks in full boost again, you know. Mm -hmm. And then so he tried to regain it. And then we were going, like, straight head on into a six-foot volcanic rock. I'm like... Oh, cool. We're gonna we're gonna hit this rock. Mm -hmm. Then we're gonna fly off the cliff, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he managed to not head on in the rock, but my rear tire hit the rock, and that control arm was basically connected to my seat, Ooh. you know. Yeah. And so I'm pretty sure I broke my back right when we hit the rock. Oh my god! But then we flew off the cliff after that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up uh, just I was in a body cast for six months you oh, know God. wow so in the moment you know because people that have had that type of a crash they say it just doesn't feel like it's ever going to stop uh it, it the first thing you think is can i move my feet because okay. i knew it was serious like the 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 concussion when we hit the rock with the rear tire was like nothing i've ever felt i've been in i hit a, a freeway divider at like 80 and that was nothing compared to this concussion, mm. you know. Wow. Matter of fact, when we hit that freeway divider, my friends, you know, you know the Mustangs, how they have the hard back seat? Yeah. Mm. His face print was in the back of that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I had I had the hugest bruise from that double seat belt, you know uh -huh. the Mustang, where you got yes. the one seat yes. belt and then you got yes. the other seat yes. belt. <laughs> I had like that raddest black and blue bruise because when I hit his face, just ate the back of the seat, pushed me even further, you know. <laughs> Oh my god. But that was nothing. That was nothing compared to this. So when it hit, I was like, oh, I'm in trouble. And then we flew off. And then I'm like, let me try to get out of my seat. And I was like, there's no get I'm, you know. And then I remember we're in the middle of nowhere in Iceland. Yeah. In like lava rock. So who's gonna get me? They didn't have a copter. So they had a four by four ambulance, right? Yeah. So they came out and I'm like, when are you gonna give me the morphine? He's like, we gave it to you 15 minutes ago. Oh, oh God. Wow. And uh, that was an interesting experience. Yeah, they gave, ended up giving me something called ketamine and like- Horse tranquilizer. Yeah, everybody said I was asleep, but I was awake. I was just like concentrating on a Kleenex box going like, it's okay, okay, stop spinning. You know, like it was mm -hmm. crazy, you know? But 
That's were, were you in a hospital then in Iceland they, for a while? Went like, to Reyk- I went to Reykjavik for eleven days, mm-hmm. and then um, they said I was fit to fly, and they're like, "You broke your back, but you know, rib cage is, is supporting it, so you're you're good. Hey, you're good. Yeah, you're good. Get out of here." Jeez. I remember wow. the bricks. on the flight, <laughs> I was like biting a wallet on the flight, like almost the entire flight, and then we had a walk because I, I couldn't sit in the chair. Like they yeah. were trying to wheel me. I'm like, I cannot sit in this chair. Yeah. And then I had I ended up walking. By the time I got to Los Angeles, I was like sweating. I was like pale. I was just pure. Mm-hmm. It was Pain. insane, you know. And I don't really like drugs, so I remember Michael George, my producer, is like, "Just take the damn." I'm like, "I'm not gonna take more than I need," you know. I'm mm-hmm. just yeah. You know, it was it was it was a weird situation. But I ended up getting another evaluation in uh, over here. And as after I took the MRI, I was driving home, and a doctor called me. He's like. You have to turn around. Mm-hmm. I want you to turn around very slowly. And you, when you get, like, if you're going to walk, you need to walk very slowly back to the, you know, the, you need mm-hmm. to. And so basically, like, uh, it had impinged my spinal cord. Yeah. And whoa. You know, yeah. I was about to be a paraplegic, you know, so it was nuts. So it was, it was the high up. Injury. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was a, God. A, a life changer, you know. So now it's like, like, I won't even race it. Like I, I, I screw around in a car, but if it's going to be something serious, it's like now you watch your wife take all the load for six months and your kids, and mm-hmm. you realize I might not be able to do any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like puts a different uh, puts a different damper on things, yeah. you know. But that's when you ended up in the body cast and the six yeah. months yeah. recovery for that. Yeah, and then like, what was the recuperation after that? Then was there a lot of rehab? And I'm super lucky. Like I'm like pain free. You know, yeah, that's I, great because back injury sometimes just mm-hmm. yeah, but, yeah. I mean, it obviously there's always going to be a little bit of something from that. Yeah. You know, like yeah. <laughs> you, you kind of move wrong, and since it's already like I'm a hunch, so since it's already the the uh, ligaments or or whatever are stretched, so like if you kind of I remember I was torquing an LS uh, crank bolt, 240 pounds. I was like, ah, ah. it was like two months of not moving right for that. You know? <laughs> so I got to kind of pick and choose what I'm yeah, doing. But yeah. what, but really like the most uh, lucky, you know, grateful dude ever after something like that. You sure. know? That's crazy. So there, when this kind of stuff happens to people, obviously you're incapacitated to a degree. So the only thing you got to do is sit, sit around and think. So, if anything, what changed in the business or what did you think about, analyze, come back and change six months away from being able to do anything? What did you kind of use that for moving forward? Uh, I think the one thing you realize is that, uh, and even like I, I, I've like been through some stuff recently and like finally it's been drilled into my head, but but time moves fast mm-hmm. and, you know, I've got kids. And uh, the one thing you really realize is that this business um, – It'll never like I think this guy uh, Jay I was talking to the other day. He says like you could it'll you can feed it and it will never stop eating. I could be in that shop twenty four hours a day oh, yeah. and always have something to do. And since I'm excited about it, my mind doesn't stop. Yeah, you know. And so probably the biggest thing for me is slowing down enough um, to where. I'm doing stuff with my kids. Me yeah. and my me and my wife are doing things, and um, you know, before it was like I'm doing this for them, but really it was for me, and I was grinding, and I missed a lot. You know, like yeah. I still was a good dad, and we did stuff on the weekends and stuff. But man, if I if I had a chance to to go back, I would I would do more. You know, so yeah. now I'm lucky enough to have realized this. I got my one boy who's 11. Like we're I taught him how to like. He's kind of, he's he's kind of interested. So like, I'm like, all right, well, we're gonna build a go kart, and he's like, well, okay, I want this one. I'm like, no, no, we're not <laughs> buying a go kart. <laughs> You're going to yeah, build it yeah. from scratch, you know. So he's used all the machines, cut all the tubing, he's MIG welded it all together, you know. Like, so this thing is gonna be, it's gonna be a yes. little Jeep, and he's yeah. gonna have made it, you know. And um, so like that right now. If if anything happened with that, that was like a big deal. As far as on the uh, the business end, um, when that had happened, um, like a, a bunch of things had happened. I'm not even going to go into the drama yeah. of like some of the employees and stuff, but 
um, I never had sold my turbochargers to the public. And I'm like, man, I'm going to lose the business. Like, I'm sitting here, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm like a n- terrible micromanager, right? So I got to have my hands in everything, you know. And uh, <laughs> I need a. Le- that's one thing I'm, I'm learning more is to give some more responsibilities to others. Mm-hmm. But at the time, I'm like, well, I could sell these turbos and, um, you know, and I could, you know, possibly, you know, get by with selling the turbos. And so my fabricator made me this like, uh, you know, screen that if you ever go into my office, it's still in my office, but it, it can rotate like this. It can lift. So I was laying on the couch in a body cast with a computer vertically. And so I could, you know, mm. take all the phone calls and make sales, do like PayPal invoices and everything in my freaking body cast, you know? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so any rate, we sold like, you know, I don't know, three or four hundred thousand dollars in turbos and that. And we're talking about the mirror, mirror image turbos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like we, we we patented those turbos and you know, you know they're basically in hot rod. Nobody ever had mirror image. You had a, you have a reverse rotator for like Mitsubishi and shit, but nobody did it. You know that was like Freiberger's car and a Pontiac yeah. for me building all those systems. I'd have to try to put them at forty five degrees or snail them in the front. I hated that unsymmetry look. Mm-hmm. So. You know, we started making them like the first ones we started making out of solid Inconel. You know, like it take fourteen hours to cut turbine. Solid Inconel, wow. yeah. Like well, the Yikes. turbines, right? yeah, yeah. But just wow. the price of that, it was like three cutters, yeah. and fourteen hours to do the turbine. You know, but I'm like, I don't care, man. It's mirror image. You know, it's cool. Somebody's like, hey, how much for that? It's like twenty five grand for the set, man. They're like, what are you talking about? Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I, that guy's big box, eighty nine grand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm just trying to keep up. Yeah. yeah. But we did. So I ended up partnering up with Brad over at Turbonetics, and you know we had our own designs and stuff, and and then then it became like available to the masses, you know. And I used to sell them at four thousand dollars a set, and then I worked a deal with Brad if we bought in quantity or whatever. And I was like, you know, I won't make much on a turbo when I had broke my back, but I'll sell them for two thousand dollars a set. Let's see what happens, and maybe we make you know. 10% versus yeah. like a big amount. And we went from selling like, you know, 40 cents a year to like insane amount, you know, at the time. Mm. Now we're back to downtown, basically nothing just because I've kind of, I don't know, my mind's elsewhere, which I need to turn that back mm. on again. But, uh, but anyway, it was it, it, that, that, um, that kind of taught me like, okay, well, if you can't be at the shop, what, how does the business run? So then we came up with, so I had 141 engine combinations that we were selling. Like, how the hell do you run a business with 141 engine combinations, you know? Wow. So we changed that to, you know, you know, now if you look at my offerings, so we got a bunch of LS stuff, but yeah. if you look at my Ford offerings, I have two. You know, if you look at my Chrysler options, I have three, I think, you know. So we shrunk it down to, I don't even know anymore, let's call it 30 or something. Mm-hmm. And then we based – everything on one size motor so like if you want an ls you're getting a 427 from me rather than i could do a 388 i can do yeah, a 360 right. i could we could do a 454 i can right. do this you know and um especially during COVID, it was like you know and even still right now like nobody stocks anything anymore like mm-hmm. yeah crankshaft manufacturers i don't know if you know if you guys are you know going through anything like this but it's like oh yeah i'll, I'll take a good crank it'll be 10 months you know i hear months. about it yeah i heard about it from a lot of builders <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm crazy so and then the customers call how long you're like a year they're like a year Mm -hmm. it's like what's gonna take 10 months to get the parts you know so now we buy in quantity you know really good blocks really good cranks in quantity and and try to we still are behind because you still can't keep up Mm -hmm. but uh at least it makes it a hundred times easier so like last year and this sounds like really small potatoes but last year we we shipped like i don't know 50 some odd motors but those were Mostly customs. Mm-hmm. This year, we're going to ship like 120 mm-hmm. engines. Um, and like it's, it's over double, you know, the yeah. engines. And yeah. the engine packages are so much freaking better. Yeah. Like I got Billy doing Spintron tests on camshafts. We're doing like, you know, we're probably on our 400th twin turbo pro touring series right now. So Wow. I was just talking to Brian at CP about doing like abradable coatings so we can start designing the skirts exactly the way I want them rather than you build it, the guy runs it, 
and then we're off to another combination with a different set of pistons, yeah. you know. So even even airflow research, like we just made a deal with airflow research, we specify the CHE seat, the CHE guide, the CHE retainer, the what valve job, all this other stuff. So we're able to like when you're buying this package from me, mm-hmm. it is legit, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for the money. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously I could build something even gnarlier if you want to spend double, but a lot of people aren't in that, you know. You do a lot of durability testing on those too. I've, I've seen your Instagram videos where you run those things for like hours. Yeah. So like that, our Twin Turbo Pro Touring Series, when we developed it, I had like four or 500 pulls on it before I okayed that the parts were mm-hmm. okay. You know, and that's all 1,000, 1,500 horsepower. So, mm-hmm. you know, four or 500 pulls. My dyno pulls are long. You run, yeah. I run them in the, like the, in the slow setting. So it's like a, it's like. 10 to 15 seconds, mm-hmm. yeah. mm-hmm. four or 500 times, you can pretty get good idea if this thing's going to take a hit or not, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so when you talked about shrinking the number of combinations down, is it is it the idea that uh, almost like going to McDonald's, right? You're going to order the, the number one through 10 meal type of thing. But the idea that people now are swamped with so much information from so many different sources, it, the normal guy at home that wants to buy an engine can drown in all that, right? Yeah. That and... We are making more power than anybody. Yeah. It, back in the day, it was like, Dude, give me 500 horse. Mm-hmm. It's got these airflow 210s. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so I got a mechanical roller with Herbert lifters in this thing, man. Yep. It's nasty, you know? And they did. They sounded badass. But oh, yeah. now, like, I can literally give you a 1,000 horsepower engine. You can drive it to Vegas. Yeah. You can get, like, on the freeway, 16 miles at a gallon probably. Yeah. And never adjust the valves. Go up in elevation; it adjusts itself. Yeah, and it's stupid. And then if you got a car that hooks, for example, we have like now this car isn't like so much of a street, even though he drives it on the street. Like one of our packages, it's like it's like a mix between our hot. It's like a hot rod series. So it, on the dyno, a correlation horsepower. To a quarter mile on my dyno, it made like seventeen hundred and fifty horsepower. You could drive this thing, and look, like the valve springs are inch two eighty, right? So it's got like three eighty on the nose, mm-hmm. like yeah. nothing, you know, hydraulic yeah. roller, mm-hmm. and that car goes like one ninety three and a quarter. Wow. Okay, yeah. but I can go take that to right. Arizona if I want to, right. you know, and I could have the AC blasting with the tunes going on, and but that's obviously. If you're gonna get a car to go that fast, it, it's a really set up car. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, most of these guys is in a pro touring car, and you're burning tires at 200 right. miles mm-hmm. an hour. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> spring right like a dump yeah. truck on yeah. the car. Yeah. <laughs> the one of the things I think it's interesting is uh, to me, like when when you really came on the scene and, and people really started to understand what you were doing, it was the horsepower numbers that people were just blown away with. But I think at some point, even you realized that, like, okay, it's th- I cannot keep. I have to keep topping myself to a degree, but the, just the horsepower number is not what you need to keep topping. So when did that transition happen? And because to me, you could have got lost in that. You yeah. could have just rode that right to the end. Well, here's yeah. the four thousand horsepower yeah, and the right. six thousand. Well, yeah. so what are we doing? Yeah, I mean, we got a seven hundred inch, uh, like semi hemi Sunny's motors with two one oh sixes on it. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. like, but that doesn't. That's not really exciting me. What excites me is like I like driving. Yeah, you know, like even driving here is like a. In two hour traffic, I was listening to music and just mm-hmm. sometimes those are the best times, it's just mm-hmm. chilling by yourself, listening to music and driving, yeah. you know. So, for me, now we provide a package. So, yes. you're going to get headers, you're going to get wiring, you're going to get it tuned, it's going to fit your car. So, like, if you have an LS, I can pretty much fit this thing in anything American muscle, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. I name it, and I've got a fixture for it, you mm-hmm. know. Um, we don't do the intercoolers anymore because that was like, you know, oh, we fixed your intercooler. It'd be like, oh, I got a roaster shop chassis. Oh, I have an Art Morrison chassis. Right. Oh, I have this. It's like. You can't keep up with yeah. all those combos. <laughs> yeah. So I just go to say go to Bell or go to whoever and they'll make you the, that stuff. But we have, you know, blower NA combos. But all of that stuff is, uh, you know, I went instead of going higher, higher, higher horsepower, I went better for the customer, better for the customer, better for the customer. And, um that's what we're trying to do. We still are, you know, good luck, you know, a year to yeah. get, get a motor from me. But yeah. when you get it, it's complete, it's badass, and it and it's a real street engine, you know. Um, 
It's not bucking, you know, like mm-hmm. you got it. <laughs> you got a too little low speed in second when you let the clutch out and you're like almost, ah, 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 you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, it's it's uh, it, it's great. I, I still have to have those passion projects, you know, so we still have a lot of these crazy little builds that we're doing. Uh, but, you know, I drove, somebody came by just for like a, hey, could you, the idol was falling too slow and it was a stick car can you come by and he bought one of our blower packages mm-hmm. and I, I you almost forget how gnarly these things are you know i mean i was just just putting this thing around like it's like a crate motor you know and yeah. then you get in it and you're like in third just like what it's like it's like electric torque the the whipple stuff i mean it's like just yeah kabang you know it's crazy and the turbo torque is like that's where the the devil and the angel have a conversation, you know. You're like, this is the sickest thing ever, <laughs> and this guy's like, you're gonna die. <laughs> Let out of it. Let out of it already. But it just keeps pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. You go another gear, it's pulling and pulling and pulling. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, okay, that's enough for me. <laughs> I'm past my limit, you know. Yeah. So, do you have a hard time? Uh, do the customers having a hard time understanding like what you're talking about? Here's a thousand horsepower that you can drive anywhere, and they're like, "Well, no, I need because, you know, a Hellcat has eight hundred and whatever it is. Yeah, you know, I I need more than that, like and a you know this much more. Yeah, power. yeah, yeah. Oh, we get that. We get that all the time. Yeah. I think what I I like to do now is like I think I I like to think that we're artists. So mm-hmm. I like like I think I build functional mechanical art. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Usually if you're coming to me, you're coming to me not only because we make power and it's and it's pretty complete, but it also has a specific look that sure. we do, you mm-hmm. know. And um, so, but yeah, it, it is, uh, for example, we built a twin turbo Chevelle for this guy, mm-hmm. right? And I told him to make 1800. Mm-hmm. So on the dyno, I, I tugged it, it made 1600. He said, do we make 1800? I'm like, I'll turn it up and make 1800, you know? So we did. <laughs> But I remembered that. Yeah. So when we got together, I put it in the car. I had it set at 900, you know. Yeah. I got into third and he grabbed my hand. He's like, dude, shut it down. I'm like, we're going to turn it up to 1800. Yeah, yeah. We're not even, we're not even halfway there. What are you talking yet. about? This is puss fill right here, dude. <laughs> it's a whole different ball game. That's 1800 people... on a street is like, it's, it's, it, it, there's one guy that actually, there's two guys, but one guy is a VP of Shelby, Gary Patterson. We built a twin turbo code red for him. And that car was brutal. It made 1160 to the tire. Uh-huh. It was like they were going to sell it as a package before Carol died. And I'm not going to tell you how fast we were going because he's VP of Shelby. But he gets, he, he would get into fifth and I'd be screaming at him. And I was clipped out, man. That dude, I didn't even know it was in the car. He's mm-hmm. just like, ah! <laughs> on regular freeways you wow. know i'm like we don't have a what are you doing get me out of this f- car man <laughs> and he's just like in it's like he just clicked into heaven when he got into fifth it's just uh-huh. like the birds were singing man <laughs> <laughs> like and there's nothing i i literally was screaming at him he didn't hear me he's just in his little zone and i remember giving him the car he's like well i just had to make sure that it was good enough to drive back to vegas and then he showed me like an obscene number of how fast he was going oh to Vegas. God. You know, wow. So that yeah. guy probably wasn't scared of it, uh, right? Yeah, <laughs> but most people, yeah, sure. most people have no conception, yeah, at all. So we have to talk about F bomb because this, after all, is a hot rod podcast. And you know how important was that car for you? And by the time you built that car, you'd been in business forever. You'd established yourself. But what, if anything, did F bomb do for your business or for your image or any of that stuff? I mean, Freiburger, like. I was like a, I was like the plagued Freiburger. <laughs> <laughs> I was that upcoming guy that saw him at SEMA. I'm like, there's Freiburger. <laughs> and then he'd be like, oh, f- Nelson's <laughs> coming down the aisle, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I twisted him so bad because we were what we were doing with Turbo Stuff, I want the world to know what we were doing with Turbo Stuff. There was guys like... Moran was killing it, sure. and then there was um, I forgot his name. Really good guy in Detroit used to do Stilo stuff. Um, 
uh, God, I can't believe it. Wheel to Wheel. Oh, Wheel to Wheel. Uh, Kurt Urban? Kurt Urban. Kurt Urban. He was yeah, doing Kurt badass Urban. Great shit. Guy. Yeah, he's down at Scott and Dickie yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was doing badass stuff. Um, and, and and we were doing badass stuff. So I want it, like, we were doing the turbo stuff. Moran was, like, doing, like, crazy drag race turbo yeah. stuff. And I was doing street turbo stuff. And I, I wanted to bring that to be seen. And uh, and Freiberger, I was like, man, let's let's do something. Let's do something. Let's do something. Do something. Finally, he like he knew I, he wasn't shaking me. Mm-hmm. I think it'd been two years, you know, mm-hmm. really just persistent, yeah. just busting his ass. I mean, yeah. emails like, look at this video. Look what we're doing. We're doing. We're doing. See me. Like, oh no, Nelson again. <laughs> love you know? me, David. Love yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and finally, he's like, all right, all right. And they had this uh, motor. It was called the Anvil. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the Anvil had been through all these reiterations mm-hmm. of. You know, tunnel ram, whatever it was, mm-hmm. I forgot how many iterations they mm-hmm. did with the anvil. Mm-hmm. So he's like, "Look, I got this anvil motor. Could you do something with this?" And so I'm like, "Sure, we'll just twin turbo it. You know, mm-hmm. that's gonna be it." And so we started building the twin turbo for the anvil. And I, I, I called him. I said, "You know, we really probably be a good idea that we test fit this in a car if you want to put it in something." And he's like, "I got this junk Camaro, you know." Uh-huh. Um, I'm like, would you want? Would you think you'd want to put that in there? And he's like, sure, we'll throw it in the Camaro at some point, you know. But you know, Freiburg, he's got like seven thousand cars, you know, and none of them run, <laughs> right, you know. Right. <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. So I called my tow guy Mario, and Freiburg didn't even know. I'm like, go steal this car, you know, like go take this car. So we took the car out of Freiburg's, and I got pictures of this thing. It was junk, you know. <laughs> And we took it. I didn't tell him we blasted the body, did everything. I was like, we're building this car, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, so we, he came by, and I'm like, dude, check it out, man. He's like, dude, what are you doing, man? <laughs> I thought you were going to fit headers. <laughs> but then then he got jazzed about it, you know? Yeah. And then I just drained his bank account, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I tapped him. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then we built the F-bomb, and Freiburger, like, you know, Freiburger's somebody that's special to me in the industry because – a lot of times you can put out a lot of effort um, and then not get a lot of return. But I don't know how he manages it all because he probably has to, like, you know, help this guy and this guy and this guy. Cause all these guys, they help everybody out, yeah. you know. But he paid me back tenfold, you know. So whatever we put into the car, it was like – Hey, you know, Hot Rod TV's doing an episode on the car now. And, oh, we got the cover twice for the motor and for the car. And there's an eight-episode so- – I forgot how many episodes uh, in the mag that we did. Mm-hmm. So the car was huge for me. That – and we did, like, a thing with Coddington early on, did a twin turbo vet for American okay. Hot Rod and Discovery and stuff. So between, you know, Coddington and and Freiburger and everything, all the little publications that were happening, F-Bomb was – it's almost like, I don't know, you know, that's just one of those cards that'll always be linked to Nelson Racing, you know. Matter of fact, we're Friday one. He's gonna be pissed because I'm telling you this right now, but we're we're redoing it a little bit right now. It's not gonna be crazy, but okay. we are same re- motor. It's still a, I like. We still made it a four hundred six. Okay, it's still twenty three degrees. Okay, okay, small I'm block. good with that. Yeah, I'm good with cool. you know because yeah. I didn't want to change it. You know, yeah. I could have easily put like some big block and made it you know six second car or whatever but i was like then it's not the f-bomb anymore yeah you know so we tried to make it all but we are gonna it's probably make another 300 horsepower you know so that'd be 1800 right probably, 15 yeah, 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 Ooh, yeah that sounds yeah. good yeah so we'll see but with my schedule and his schedule right you know coming we'll, this we'll, summer <laughs> <in> 2029 <laughs> exactly you know <laughs> but the turbo system's done for it i put some of our new turbos on it and we got everything, you know. Everything's machined, so he's gonna he's gonna stab me for telling you that. But. That's good. I'll take I'll take a little I'll take a little jab on the side. It's fine. <laughs> It'll be a good so, social media moment. Yeah. So what what keeps you excited about your business? I mean, it, uh, to me, you know, the alien intake manifold was one thing that obviously was a signature of yours, and and the mirror image turbo is the f bomb. Like, what are the things that kind of keep that adrenaline gland firing for you? Uh, I mean, now it's 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 like. It, there's so much right now. Like from when I started to now, now like the arena is like you, you're almost like a mini OE if you want to be. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got some CAD designers that are really good. You know, like it's it's funny because they're half like most of the guys that are really good are just eccentric. 
Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. crazies yeah. that you love. Yeah. You know, you, you but they're they're a hard pill to swallow at first. But then sure. then you're like, this is awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, so and I've got fabricators that are like I'll watch them. And I'll just see how they're using the file. I'm like, why are you using the file that way? But they're like, they're way beyond me. You know, like I build engines and I have this vision, right? And I'm the guy with the drive and pushing everything. But the guys that are doing stuff now are so good that, I mean, like on, for example, like Maximus, like that car, those panels are handmade. You know, that car is six inches wider. That's just steel mm-hmm. sheet that got mm-hmm. shaped into mm-hmm. a charger, mm-hmm. you know. And you can't even, like, well, you can. That's the beauty of it is if you look close, you can see the seam weld from the color of the weld. Yeah. But the car is, you know, like, I'll never do it again, you know. <laughs> right. For two years, all you heard was a hammer and a dolly, you know. But it was like, let's see if we how far we can do this. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we stopped doing cars at the beginning of the year, just because it was just taking away too much time from like my mind, even though we have probably three years of cars to finish. Yeah, right you're now. not taking new. You're not taking new 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 order. We're done with the cars. Yeah. You know, maybe at some point Down we'll the do them again. But right now, if you know, I've got so much to do with the business at the cars. You know, but we are we are working on it on a an all wheel drive GTO, which is going to be the sickest thing. To hit the floor ever, you know. That's, I mean, and we've done everything. We made the frame. We made the transfer case. We made the, you know, the rear end, which is like to get equal length half shafts has like three pinions on each side or three gears on each side. It's just this thing is so freaking bananas. It's mm-hmm. not even funny. Um, so I that, I can't wait to to finish that one. Um, but you know, just everything gets me excited. Like you know. I, like the the metal printing right now, and then if you get the AI involved with the metal printing, that's some weird too. That's like brand new to me, you know. Um, what's that process, and what's what does AI solve that? Uh, like you want it really light and structural, and you give it, you know, some ideas, and it basically comes up with this design, and it looks like a insect or something. Uh, but you know, it's it's super weird. You know, I've seen um, we toured Singer. Yeah, in Torrance, when they do it, it does. It looks like a thing that look, like you poured steel down at an ant hill. Yeah, <laughs> you've seen that or molten <laughs> aluminum. You've seen that wow. video, and it's the shape that comes out it looks like nothing. It's gonna change. It's gonna change a lot of stuff. You know, and I it, mean, it's the strength where it needs to be, but none of that in between stuff. On, would... on that two Tara car, the fastest production car in the world that we do the powertrain for. Yeah, I've got um, printed uh, collectors, Inconel printed collectors on that thing. They do not break. You know, and they're printed. Like I thought, oh, we're gonna crack these things, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. but it was this real elaborate design where we had two scrolls going into one, and it'd be really hard to hand make that. Yeah. So we three D printed it and put the two tar crest on it. Also, <laughs> wow, <laughs> they're crazy. You know, so the world is it's the wild west right now. It's the wild yeah. west for hot rod builders. And, and even in that, the the two tar stuff is kind of down that road as well. Like the ability of a boutique small manufacturing outfit to create something on the level that they've created. How did that partnership come to come to pass? I had built him um, some motors for the Aero TT. Uh, that, w- that was their predecessor car, which broke the record. Yes, when yes. they were Shelby supercars or whatever. Right? Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So so they um, they had broke the record. with. They took Bugatti's record, and then Bugatti took it back. And then Jared kind of went silent for a little while, and he came out with the Chitara. And then he's like, you know, what can we do with this? And then we came up with this crazy twin turbo flat plane thing. And let me tell you, I was there. I was there when it went 295 at Kennedy, and that's insane. As an engine builder, you're like, yeah, like it go it it, it goes <laughs> into like fifth, right, and mm-hmm. then it gets into sixth, and you can't see the car anymore because you're at the starting line, and you almost can't hear it. Yeah, and you're like, oh, he's out of it. And then you're like, damn. As an engine builder, you're like, oh. I made <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, like two or three seconds later, you hear him click into seventh. Ah! You're like, oh my god, it's still going! It's still going! You know, thirty pounds of boost for you know what feels like a year of your life. It, I, bet. It's, I think it's yeah. only like a minute, but yeah. it's it's uh-huh. not a, an eighth mile, right. you know, or a quarter. Right, it's right. it's a minute. You know, it's crazy, and um, and we've blown some shit up too. I bet. <laughs> 
but it is f- unbelievable how reliable that thing is. We got a um, uh, a thing, a computer. It's called uh, Life Racing, and my good buddy Chris Danzio is like the U.S. Life Racing. Okay, this, this guy is like he's Yoda when it comes to <laughs> when, it, when it comes to tuning. You know, yeah, love this guy. And not only that, we'll be in like the most stressful situations, and he has a way of just making everything funny. You know, you're like, <laughs> you're going to lose your leg. You're like, no way. I'm losing my leg. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it, that thing has safeties upon safeties upon safeties upon, you know, cra- we got 12, oh, two, wait, no, we got, we got 10, uh, lab grade wide bands on that car with like eight pressure transducers. It's insane. My car is awesome. What are the basics of that combination? That's an LS, basically, like an LS architecture engine, right? Yeah. So, I mean, nothing LS about yeah. it left, but yeah. So, but it's a it's a flat plane. It's got like a Bryant flat plane in it. It's got um, uh, Potter titanium rods. Um, so, like the bob weight on that thing, which handles now like twenty two hundred horsepower, is fifteen hundred grams. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's crazy, and, and it turns over eight thousand RPM. It's got you know. All you know, it's it's pretty basic, really. Mm-hmm. But it's 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 uh, intelligent, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, and and you could make some crazy, you know, make some dual overhead cam shit. You could go all down that road just to say it's there, yeah, right, right, and and just make it that uh, whatever kind of sexy thing that you can just brag on all the stuff. But at the end of the day, the thing makes. However many, what, 1,800, whatever it makes for power. Yeah, the new one makes 2,200. There you go. Yeah. So it makes 2,200. Yeah. And to your point, what you talked about a few minutes ago, aesthetically, it's a beautifully clean look. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's that's the beauty is that not only does that, that thing looks like, uh, there's a front view that looks like a Darth Vader helmet. It looks mm-hmm. so sick. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. got all the stainless pipes and it's mm-hmm. just like doing a most muscular for me or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. But it also... You know, we've had a couple out in the field for like three years. You know, we had one come in for a teardown just to look. Mm-hmm. And the thing was like, dude, the thing's money. You nice. know, like it's so nice. And a flat plane usually rattle themselves to death. But we sure. we made the bob light so it didn't, you know. So you had the engine in the Riddler, the, one, the car that won the Riddler in 2019. So does that, does that tick off something in a box you had in the back of your mind. It's it like cool. if you want to validate this idea of, mm-hmm. of artistry and a presentation, like how much did that carry weight with you versus somebody winning a race or whatever? That one was special. I don't do you know the story behind that no. one? Okay. So we went to SEMA. Um that's actually was part of the show too, but we went to SEMA. Um Jordan from Super Rides by Jordan okay. approached me, said we got this um you know, this Cadillac that we're building, we need a special motor for it. Somebody was building a V12 or 16 for it and it never panned out. Can you do it? And then he's like, but you got to meet the guy um, to make the deal because he's just that that way. Um, and I was at the SEMA show. He's like, could you come to his house? He lived in Vegas. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know, I don't know, man. You know, you know how SEMA is. Oh, yeah, it's like, just, you're you're yeah. tired, yeah. you know. But I'll, all right, I'll meet him. So we go to his house. <laughs> his house, he's got an elevator. <laughs> okay. I'm taking a piss in his house. There's a f- Rembrandt on the toilet. In the bathroom? In the bathroom. <laughs> the real Rembrandt. He's like, no cameras in the house. No cameras in the house. Okay. Right? At any rate, we, wow. we like go downstairs in this elevator. He's got like prototype Cadillacs, 50 f- cars in his, gra- in, the, in his garage that he has in this house. Wow. And we shake hands to do this. And he said, look, this is my life goal to win the Riddler. Like, this is something I've always wanted to do. I want to win the Riddler. So you got to be building me something special. So we built him the motor. Um, Jordan continued on with the car. Steve passed away. So mm-hmm. Wow. Steve passed away. So his brother on Steve's, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know, death, whatever, told his brother, you got to finish the car for me. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to finish the car. So his brother funded the rest of the car. And we went there, and I had we had another client there um, with this uh, with this Nova. So it was a contender too. So like there was a a couple of our stuff cars that were there, and um, and so he won the Riddler, dude. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, dude, we 
everybody was crying, mm-hmm. yeah, you know? Sure. Like, Jordan was and, – and so Jordan – built the car with his son. So like, I know how important that is. So his son and Jordan built this thing. I don't know how, over how many years, but just crazy. So they're crying and hugging. We're all hugging. I mean, it was huge moment. It was insane. We didn't think we were going to win because, you know, Jordan just pointed out the flight. You get those judges, like fucking 10 ants crawling on the car. And they're just Mm -hmm. like, this is, this is, this is, but Jordan kind of took a different approach. He's just like, look, look, I screwed up the paint here. Like, this is, you know, but they, I think it won based on the Riddler's essence is custom, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. You win based off of custom, right? Yeah, so yeah. that thing had like yeah. the tranny in the back. It had IndyCar A arms. It's yeah. like everything about it. If you didn't like it, fine, but it was, it was custom, right? So everything was touched, everything was changed. So it to have won the Riddler was awesome. And what's even crazier is I did, um, for Boyd, there was a guy named Snix. I did a whole engine bay for Boyd in 03, maybe, right? And the car disappeared. And I got a call for people freaking out on me because I just made them lose the Riddler. This is 2018. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I'm not even doing a Riddler car. Well, I had posted a YouTube video of the engine bay of this car we did for Boyd. And it reemerged no in way. 18 wow. Wow. as a Riddler contender. <laughs> wow. It won the Riddler. Get out of it here. won the Riddler in 18. I built that engine bay in 03, dude. 03. <laughs> it was crazy. So they're f- pissed off at me. And Sean Dove calls me. Is like, dude, like, what did you do? I'm like, what are you talking about? In 03, it was okay to show a car in metal for the Riddler, you know? <laughs> so they 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 kicked him out and then he freaked the hell out. And then they judged that he it was legit, like, and they won the Riddler. I didn't see the card. For yeah, right. <laughs> and what a random thing. You're like, yeah. oh, this is cool. After that, then it turns into some giant disaster. Yeah, it's crazy. So I'm glad he didn't lose the Riddler because of me. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be that guy. <laughs> so I, I guess as we're kind of getting to the end of the conversation, I think a natural question is you look at your business, you look at the marketplace, you look at trends. Like, what is Nelson Racing Engines look like in five years from now? Products, probably. We've got a whole ton of products and really, really nice crate engines that you can, that are really refined, you know, but uh, products, I've got so many awesome products that I haven't launched that that'll be in the next couple of years. We'll, we'll get all those. I got 18 products right now that are just waiting. They're just like, what are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) Get them on the market. (laughs) So probably products. Uh, well, I was, I've always been impressed with the way you package everything. I remember the first time I saw one of your thousand horsepower crate engines at a car show, uh, I think it was in Simi Valley and just the way it's presented with the the crate, the wooden crate and everything. And I'm, I'm just, I'm happy we're able to do that photo shoot with you at your shop and like he, you held engines, uh, you're, you just delayed shipping them to customers so we could do that photo shoot. And there was something like, I think there was 38 engines or something that was the 40,000 horsepower wow the cover blurb that we did and, yeah i mean you you are probably the nicest editor of hot rod <laughs> God. In, in the history of hot rod i i don't think i've ever met a, a like better guy and then you're like uh uh would you be interested in doing a shoot you know and I'm, I'm like yeah sure and you're like it's for the cover i'm like yeah, let's do okay. this. That you was, know, that was pretty great, though. <laughs> so we st- I've never had we stacked forty turbo and blown motors together. That was awesome. You know, mm-hmm. it's like something. And even uh, Larry, who was shooting it, was like, "Oh no, Wes was mm-hmm. shooting it." Larry shot the uh, Maximus. Maximus, yeah, probably, yeah. The, like the cover with the three motors, right? Yes, was that Larry? That's, yeah, yeah, that's correct. But yeah, Wes, awesome. Wes was the first cover i ever had photographed was f- the f-bomb engine mm-hmm. and i remember i was telling wes yes, what to do it's a great picture too so and i you know wes a oh, yeah. bit. i don't know wes a lot but i know, I'm from I know wes very he well. around yeah he you know? doesn't no. and so he had the motor up there and and i'm like he's like let's just put this pulley on i'm like dude what are you doing man he's like 
<laughs> and he looks at Freiberger, and Freiberger is like kind of nervous or whatever. He's like, just just let do what he's ass, you know, do what the guy ass, you know. And then all of a sudden, this you see the photo, and you're, I'm like, that's such a dumbass kid, man. Like I was trying to tell this guy what to do, you know. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Nah, man, thank you so much for coming and take the time. I, I think it's your story's fascinating, and and to share some of the stuff you did with us is great. Mm-hmm. And I think it just it gives people perspective. I think the the big part of this series that's been so fun for us so far is just getting into the weeds a little bit with mm-hmm. people and and just kind of getting a better picture about what day to day life is like. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. You know, when you when you called, I was like, for sure. Awesome. Is that, that was a What's great waiting for me on the other? I have no idea what, what I was walking into. I actually texted Freiberger and said, "Like, uh-huh. what am I walking into?" <laughs> he didn't know either, did he? <laughs> Hopefully, it wasn't bad. Yeah, <laughs> I think we, uh, I think this was great. Yeah, that no, was great. And thank you to John, yeah. of course. Thanks, thanks to Tom Nelson for coming in, and we will continue this series, the Hot Rod Pod, where it all began, with more guests and more great stories down the line. But today, we're done talking about horsepower. We'll see you next time. <laughs>